Well, good evening and welcome to Beyond Room 313 with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan, at the symposium, along with Jason Roba, who's down in L.A. at the moment making a film. That's why we haven't done many interviews lately. And tonight is a big night. We have a celebrity in the house, you know, so I was going to wear a suit, but I don't have one. But anyway, they say you should never meet your, they say they, they say you should never meet your heroes. But we'll, we'll, we'll consign the person who said that to being a dickhead tonight. Because we have uh, Steve Hughes, the legendary Australian comic, heavy metal pioneer in Australia, uh, actor. He's done it all, really. And uh, I mean, I can't believe I'm going to be talking to Steve Hughes. I'll tell you why. A few week, few months back, someone emailed me and said, you know, Steve Hughes is saying really nice things about you, Thomas, on some Irish heavy metal podcast. And I listened in and I was like, holy shit. Now, I've been spending years... Uh, promoting you like indirectly when i go to scandinavia i used to go quite a lot and decided to kind of like break them from their kind of scandinavian programming i used to show them that clip that club gig you did in stockholm these are mostly people in norway and i was just that's stand-up comedy that's what comedy should be today so uh steve thanks so much for coming it's absolutely fantastic to have you here and uh you know we're going to have a great fun tonight i hope thank you man thanks for coming I mean, same here. I've been listening to you for ages, watching yeah. you wander around the Irish countryside with your camera, telling me about stuff. So, <laughs> fair, we, have, fair. We, have, we have a couple of mutual friends and acquaintances. Aidan Killian, the stand up comic here, I was with him a few weeks ago. And uh, Greg Moffat, who was Damien in uh, the Cradle of Phil keyboard player. And he was also a journalist. He, you know him as well. So it's like a small, oh. we all kind of circle in, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all totally. like little planets that come close to one another. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. this show is, you know, this show more or less is primarily deals with spiritual issues. Not necessarily, but we tend to generally have creative people on and talk about these things. And I don't know how you really feel about this stuff. Although I have a feeling you do have a kind of a, a that side to you. But yeah. um what I will say is that, like, I often found heavy metal to be a very shamanic type form of music. Now, I grew up on that too, with the new, the, the new wave of British heavy metal. That was a big, but I was also very much into goth and things like that. We spoke about that. I love, I love Susie and the Banshees and Bauhaus and all. Maybe that'd be my kind of music. Now, the new stuff you're doing at the moment has that kind of vibe to it almost. The, I really like the new stuff you're doing. Do, do, you, do you feel that? that sort of like shamanic resonance in music like metal and goth. Oh as yeah. A, as a musician. Completely. Yeah. Completely. In fact, all, most of the, I was, before I came on today, I was, was I listening to, I was listening to this Swedish band called the Kana who do kind of shamanic Middle Eastern medieval music, a mixture of that kind of stuff. I'm listening to, I listen to a lot of Lisa Gerard and Enya. I've always been known to listen to Enya. Yeah. So, no, so anything no, that, no, nothing wrong with any, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Oh, mate, it's, it's masterful. But most people just get sad away. Sad. No, she's got 50,000 other songs. Right? <laughs> uh, and her family, the family clan, they made some fantastic yeah, records yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, clan, it's great that. stuff. Yeah. And but, so or, 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 when you say even shamanic, it's also, when I was young, I wouldn't have used the word shamanic. I just would have used the word real and honest. Yeah. And, and from the heart. You know, and so uh, it's what always attracted to me. I was never, you know, when I'm young, I like it's not like I don't like some bands which are considered mainstream, but they're bands that are like U2 is a mainstream band, but early U2 is masterful. Right? It's masterful oh, yeah. music. Yeah. From, from a very young age, you can tell I got there, I got I into U2 in like 81. You know, they're like an underground band. Yeah. And then, even then, though, I could tell. I mean, they're like 20 years old or something on that second album, October. That's the first one I got. I could tell then these guys have got what a lot of young musicians don't have yet. They don't have the ability to understand silence. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah do, do you know, and, they, and these guys were like locked in at that age. Just, I was like, they're like, they're like telepathic, these four guys with each other. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, there's a theory that because like, you look at the bands like you two coming out of Ireland, right? And yourself coming out of Australia and then punk bands like the, the Severed Heads and the Saints coming out of Australia as well as all the other metal bands that because Ireland and Australia are on the kind of peripheral of that Anglo-American culture, that the bands here almost have to shout louder. 
Do you know you know that kind of thing? I know exactly what you mean. Or, yeah. or, or the biggest Irish metal band, Primordial, who are great friends of mine. Their yeah. music's shamanic. Yeah. You know, it's poetic metal, as one guy described it. And it's, it, it, you know, it's deep, it's moving. The lyrics have got big meanings, you know, political, cultural, spiritual. You know, that, 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 you know, I always used to say this about Australia because as an artist in Australia, like mainstream West, Western culture in Australia, it's so fucking boring. Because art is not important, even in the collective psyche of the country. You know, when, when, when I came to England, when I lived in England, even though I know, you know, England's got its fucking your bows that haven't fucking do and couldn't give a fuck. But in the country itself, you can feel, I can still feel an artistic history within the psyche. And so, and so, like, even when I came here, I always thought to myself, I think the English are the best at comedy, but if I can make the Scottish and the Irish laugh, then I know I'm fucking funny. <laughs> you, you certainly do that i mean absolutely uh the the, the drumming thing you know uh, i i played bands myself when i was younger and uh drummers i always found to be very interesting people i should say without being uh, uh you know insulting they could be challenging people to deal with and a lot of the drummers were, were dealing with things maybe from from their past or frustrations in their lives, or maybe in your case, stuck in parts of Australia didn't want to be in. Did, did that ever, did, was the drumming that kind of like release for you? It was that kind of, you know, way of like banging out of it. It's so funny you say that. I, I, was, I was growing up in Australia, not good at maths, not good at science, not good at girls, not good at sport, not good at a dysfunctional fucking family. So yeah, you got that bit, right? So almost sitting there going, and, and, and in that country, almost because it's so influenced by Britain and America, especially growing up in the 70s, you know, a lot of English TV and a lot of, you know, just America itself, which encapsulates the world, you know. So you're watching Evil Knievel and Kiss and all this stuff, right? Yeah. So, so so America seemed like some kind of, like, what the fuck is this world? And, we're, and especially when you're in Australia, we're down the bottom just, bah, bah. Uh, uh, it was like a fucking country town. The whole country is like a country town, you know. And so I, I just, I was just lost. Like, what am I, what am I fucking gonna do here? What am I? And then when I saw Iron Maiden, is I used to hang out with this English guy who showed me all Susie and the Banshees and all that talk, talk, and like when New Romantic and post punk was coming out, and was. And then uh, I got into metal, and I saw Maiden in '82, and I tell you, it was like a fucking bullet to my brain. That went, I'm just going, to, I know what I'm going to do. And I fucking did it. Yeah. You know, once something creative just was offered to me, like, like in this, because Australia doesn't offer that to anyone. It's just, it's, and there's killer bands there and great creative people, but the place itself doesn't give a shit. You know, it's very, it's very, unless it's sport or, or, cops <laughs> they really don't <laughs> it's just ignored you know even if you're in england motorheads still motorhead but it's known isn't it you know what a fucking motorhead is you know it's 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 legendary in the in the in but australia doesn't let anything come up from the underground it doesn't care it just doesn't put it doesn't promote itself it's almost embarrassed by itself right it's almost like like lisa gerard from dead can dance who made the band with the Irish guy Patrick Cassidy? I uh, know Patrick Cassidy, uh, Brendan. Yeah, I know the guy. Yeah. I mean, what a show. She worked with Hans Zimmer. And so she's the chick who's singing when Russell Crowe walks through the forest of the dream world and Gladiator. Yeah. Uh, this is Hans Zimmer, the guy that makes the most soundtracks of the biggest films in the history of the fucking universe. She, so she's from Melbourne. No one in Australia would even know. Right. Now, the, and the Australian entertainment industry, we love that she's entertaining as far as I'm concerned. She's like divinity, but it, but 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 it doesn't 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 know, doesn't say anything. It's not like you go look. Uh, one of ours is uh, that. So he said, if I go to Australia, the Melbourne Comedy Festival, they don't fuck about me. They don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck about Jim Jeffries, the biggest stand-up comedian that's ever come out of the place. He goes there and they give him bad reviews and mock him. Wow. Well, just okay. Just to be a bit of a dick about this. I remember what a, a big influence on me as a kid was the movie Picnic at Hanging Rock by Peter Weir and that incredible, uh, um, what you call a panpipe 
uh, soundtrack. I don't know if you've seen the film. It's, a po- it's not a real short story, but it's, it's supposed to be like a legendary story. It never really happened. Of girls who went to this ab- Aborigine site. It's got, it's got Nicole Kidman in it. Young Nicole it, Kidman. It's, it's fantastic, the film. It's beautiful. Now, I used to watch that, and that, that conjured up a very romantic image of Australia in my mind. You know well, what, what? What my point was, I was going to get to actually in this whole beginning of this conversation. Was, that's what I used to find interesting about Australia. That 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 mainstream white bread culture that I grew up in. I always found it really childish, and and even today, you know, all this bullshit's going on in the world. If you watch the politicians and the cops in Australia talk, they talk to the general public like they're like condescendingly, like they're naughty children. How dare you go out there? And, and, and protest. I mean, it broke my heart to see such selfish Australians not thinking about everybody else. Or the cops are there going, and we'll prosecute you. I'm a blah, 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 blah. Because they've never seen Australians behave like this. Because, well, you know, they, they, cause they're, they're prison guards and they're prisoners. <laughs> well, fun, well now, that's interesting because funny enough, we've got the same shite in Ireland. How dare they go out and do this? Now, it's, commentators like John Waters might say it's because both of our countries have a kind of a post-colonial mentality that we want to be seen as being nice Mate, at some level to the world. The being nice thing is exactly it. Do you know that film Wake and Fright? Yeah. Right. Well, that was made by what, Ted Kochoff or whatever his name that made the first, uh, first Blood, Canadian director. Now, whether this is entirely true of the story, because that film went missing for years and years and years, and it's funny you bring up Picnic Hanging Rock. So that came out in the 70s. They took it to Europe. It was great. Look at this Australian film. Dark, pathos, hardcore, looking at issues that affect Australia. Australians were so embarrassed, the establishment so embarrassed, they've got to hide it. That's when they made things like Picnic and Hanging Rock. Right? Get, it, get films like this out of the way. Because Australia's always had an international lack of confidence. Right, so as Billy Connolly explained it brilliantly once when I was like together, he goes, you get off the plane, you're, you're walking on the runway, you're not even in the airport, you've never been there, they go, so do you like it here? Do you like it here? What do you think about it? I haven't fucking been here yet. Yeah, and to yeah. me, it was always like, you've got to project this kind of, I used to call it the home and away morality. Yeah. You, you, you know, you've got to project this home and away morality onto a world that's got far longer cultures that aren't embarrassed. They're more embarrassed by this but you're embarrassing yourself by behaving like this. So when I started to come and do comedy to like Norwegians and Finns and, and, and Estonians and Croatians, it was like, oh, great Irish, at least, you know, we're the good or smart Irish and there's dummies in all countries. But like, but like I, I could tell that I could talk about things that weren't making them go, ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you allowed to talk about things? Yeah, it's darkness. Yeah. You can talk about it. It's in the, you know. You did a a skit, a skit on the BBC, and uh, I've seen it a few times. You talk about the thing of being offended, okay? Now, that ultimately comes from the concept of political correctness. It's a way of curtailing free speech. You know, a way of saying, don't talk about this, blah, 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 because we don't like it, because you might bring up uncomfortable truths we're not happy with. I actually believe that that was a precursor to this whole political correct offensive triggering thing to the kind of bullshit we're dealing with now with the lockdown and everything it's almost like you if if you can stop people from criticizing at one level we can stop them from criticizing at every level and i think so good isn't it true isn't it fucking true it's so good to talk to someone with fucking depth (laughs) 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 because because here's another thing a lot of people can't do. They can't connect dots. They can't see where all these things are connected. LGBT, PC, feminism, multi open border policies, they're all connected not only to locking up your institutions on a practical, realistic level here and, and creating divide and conquer. They're, it's psychological warfare within your collective psyche of how you fucking behave. And yeah. it's a sense of a lack of self-preservation. Yeah. They've instilled a lack of self-preservation. And it's, this is how I describe all this stuff because it's come through all these, these institutions. They've, in, they've infected your institutions. So, so the young people now, and, and the, I, I give a good grace to the young people because they got it shit smashed into them, you know, from, oh, from, yeah. from the 20 year olds now. It's when people my age fall for it. I'm like, you know, slap around the fucking head. 
It's a t- I describe it like this. It's a long, it's been a, you know, a, it's been a generational process instead of a complete invasion. But it's like when the, when the Trojans pushed that horse in, that story, and then, you know, oh, we gave them a gift, and then the, the soldiers crawl out. To me, the psychology of young people and the people that have fallen for it is like that Trojan horse. They've done it generationally, and now your own citizens are your enemy. Right, they 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 they're destroying the very the very environment they live in. Oh yeah, which is which is, and it's funny because when me and you grew up, I do this on stage. It's like we knew metalheads and outliers and punks, and goths, and I knew all this lot. But they've twisted it now so that some guy can run around with a mohawk and fuck the system and studs all over him, but be complaining that he's discriminated against. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, when yeah. all the punk guys I knew, why do you think they dress like this? To be discriminated against. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> you, you see, you see the, it's amazing to me how people who align themselves, these types you're just talking about, and Jason and I talk about this all the time, these people align themselves with the mainstream uh, and, yes, they'll think they're outside radicals because why? <laughs> well, I, I, I fucking purple hair. You know, it's it's so funny. You know, it's like it's like how can you possibly in what fucking reality tunnel have you resolved your your yourself as being in the resistance when you're agreeing oh, with your fucking college professor and everyone else in the mainstream media? Mate, I, I was talking. I had this therapist in Australia. He was a non-dual therapist, it's Buddhism stuff, right? And uh, I was explaining this to him. Was this idea we're just talking? And then he said it's perfect. I use it for show. He goes, he goes, that's like asking the rapist to rub your back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's true. I mean, he, he told yeah. me he used to do drug rehabilitation and he was in Canada once. And there was a, a native uh, American ca- Canadian woman there, indigenous Canadian woman who'd been on drugs and was talking about the white man and the oppression and all this. And he just said to her, yeah, that's all true. Yes, but stop stop asking your oppressor, your oppressor, yeah. for fucking rights. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and on the cultural level, on the cultural level, you also nailed something else that was very good. Body bands were part of this process to, to demolish the kind of edge of music, to turn oh. it into a, a process. Now, ha- having said that, I actually know one of the guys in Westlife. He's a nice fella. But I, I, I know he's into like he's into metal, he's into metal mostly. That's just like his daily thing, his real life. But you can sort of he's a nice he's a nice fella and everything. But I wouldn't I wouldn't even with it like he's done successfully and everything. I, I wouldn't want to be that. You know, like it seems to me that it it it, it doesn't seem health not healthy. It's I, I'm sure he's happy and everything and he's a nice fella. But I wouldn't want that. You know, I wouldn't want that. No, I can't. I can't do it. Yeah. Like, I just can't do it. I just can't. It's like in this, you know, I haven't worn a fucking mask once, right? I've wandered around, walking around in shops, just doing fucking things and just, just, but people won't, I've been disconnected from the mainstream, even though I, and I had to go through a nervous breakdown to really realize what a robot I still actually was, even though I had tons of knowledge, right? But it was like, but not wisdom. <laughs> so then, uh, but this thing, it's, it's like, I don't know what you're saying. You get back to that guy. I can't do fake. No, I, I used to hate it when, when I used to hate it when people would, 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 that's what I brought up the COVID thing. If, if people have to start to cross uh, to me psychologically, disconnect here's the great opportunity of this thing they go well if you don't do this your kids won't be allowed to school go to school good that's part of the process of the awakening anyway right they're offering you what we ultimately want which is what to to, to unshackle ourselves from this fucking whole broken system that's been turning us into slaves for thousands of years so so not going to school is part of the evolution so good yeah don't, just, just, don't put your kids in these schools. Take the fucking things out. Disconnect yourself from these old beliefs that you think you've got to fucking do. Jason is younger than us, and he's a classically trained academic musician and composer. And I have been deprogramming him for the last year. And it, it's like, it, it's you can see, it, I'm, I'm only joking. I wasn't really. But I've, I've given him opportunities to go beyond what he was trained in. And, you know, Jason, as you said yourself, 
It's like, it's, it's so unbelievably liberating in every aspect of your life, not just in your creative life. Yeah. Let me, let no, me no, 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 no. You've got to, you've got to disconnect from the medical system, from the food system, but ultimately from the electrical system or what any system that these fuckers could pull the plug on. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so, you know, because, because I think then God comes into play without being too dramatic and nature can come back into your life. And, yeah. and, and humbleness through the understanding of nature can come back into your life. And, yeah. and self-preservation through, through community and fucking guile can come back, you know. Uh, I saw, I heard someone say recently, I read it in some paper or something, where someone had mentioned that the establishment, the, the, the fucking aristocrats, whatever they are, who yeah. run the art scene and run all the art galleries, most of them are atheists or agnostics. They don't actually believe in the concept of art being used to elevate you to a spiritual greatness, into, a, into other states. And therefore, modern art and art galleries today, all they, they represent what's in their souls, a few boxes and a few colors. You know? And I find that's one of, the, one of the, the great horrors of the modern world is that this, because the fuckers in charge, I prefer if they were actually mad fanatic Catholics or something like that. At least we get some beautiful basilicas or something. But they're not. We're getting boxes and squares. We're getting boxes and squares in Tracy Evans' unmade bed. Yeah. I, I, I've a story, I have a cousin who was, went to, was a fantastic natural artist here. This is a while back now, about 15 years ago. She got into top college uh, art school here. And after a year, she was stapling used tampons to a, uh, a shipping crate as some kind of statement about <laughs> fucking, uh, the tra- you know, sex trafficking or some shit like that. Uh, <laughs> and it's the tragedy of that is the world lost a great artist. I mean, I mean, I mean, when, I, I remember when I was in England in the early 2000s, I think it was, I think I was here when, yeah, it was, wasn't it when old Damien Hirsch and, Tracy Emin and that, that kind of were all, all around. He was putting sharks in formaldehyde and she was getting yeah. depressed for three days and drinking and then putting it on stage and everyone was clapping and people were pissing in jars and putting a Christ in there and nailing toilet seats to the wall. And and so th- th- there was that strange part of me that, that the artistic creative part of me was going, okay, so because I'm going, how am I supposed to get into this? And uh, am I am I too straight? Uh, do I not see? It almost makes you think, am I dumb? Because I don't know why a toilet seat down to a fucking brick wall is supposed to do something, right? But then I finally listened to good conservative spiritual artists talk about it and went, ah, oh, yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it's the reflection of what it feels in your soul. And it's, you know, when, when I say, oh, it, it's highly challenging, it's like a way of saying it's fucking shite, you know? It's yeah. like, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's highly challenging. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that. It's, it's like I want something that actually, like, stirs me inside. There's a, a you know, and um, um, beauty comes in all kinds of ways, you know, not just necessarily so, a, a glorious, like, it could not be like a fantastic work of art or complexity. It could be something so beautiful as a simple stanza in a poem or something. Yeah. The, that's all been lost. That's all been taken from us to the point where I don't think people, the younger generation, people like Jason excluded, by the way, but the younger generation of people coming out of college, I find is that a lot of them don't even understand metaphor and allegory. You notice that? Like, that's because they can't get jokes. You know, like, uh, so much of sat like, like, you look, I don't know if you know Dave Allen. He was an Irish uh, stand-up. Oh, yeah, I used to watch him. So I used to watch him. That's why we got he British. Was like a, yeah, he, was, he was more like a philosopher than a, than a comic, right? But I used so to watch much- him as a kid with his, with his missing finger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and the glass of the glass of the whiskey in his hand and whiskey the cigarette, cigarettes. Yeah, on, yeah on mainstream and prime time and bees. But he was, you'd sit there in 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 just completely captivated by these stories he told of his life and his experiences and stuff like that. I don't, and so much of it was related to metaphor and allegory. I don't yeah. think if if he was around today, he it might as well be talking Japanese to people in in the English speaking world. They wouldn't get it. Mate, they don't, it's funny you say that, how they don't get these things. It's like, oh, system. That's why I like, sometimes I, I, spend, I watch reaction videos, right? Because I like seeing young people listen to fucking music yeah. and they're like, oh, my God, right? And they 
hear Karen Carpenter's voice like I did when I was a kid. You know, I'd hear it once in a while on the radio. It was just one line in and, and she's got you. Yeah. You know, she, she just transport me to this fucking world. Right? And when you're talking about allegory and all that, I was listening to one watch Tom uh, Jones sing Delilah the other day. And, of course, the song is Delilah. And she fucked around behind his back. And then she went. he went and knocked on the door and she started laughing and I got my pistol and now she'll be laughing no more. All right. So he's so right. But as a kid, I never thought, Oh, if you get upset, you kill chicks. No, this is this is an expression of of the depth of pain that oh, yeah. you know that, that, that this can tra- drag you to. Even as a kid, I wasn't fucking. I was like, well, someone just go and shoot her in the foot. No, <laughs> this is the theatre and the and the, the expression of a deeper pathos within what a broken heart might do to you. You know what I mean? So yeah. tread lightly, I'm- choose wisely. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, the first, the first single I ever bought, and I, I, you know, I'm actually ha- hammering my cool pretensions on the wall here, was Life on Mars by David Bowie. I was fucking nine. Don't, I don't know why, but I bought, and we used to sit around that like nine and 10 and listen to these bizarre lyrics on that song and try to decipher them, but we were fully aware that they were, they were metaphorical, that they, they meant something else. We tried to, what do you mean by Mickey Mouse goes up a cow? That was innate in Western society, in, in the English-speaking world, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, that's gone now. It's no longer innate. Oh, uh, I know what you mean. That, that to me is fucking terrifying. Oh, yeah, it is, because it takes you to a psychological flatland, you know, like, like I used to read Ken Wilber, he's an American spiritual Western philosopher guy, sometimes called the smartest man in America you've never heard of. He's had a rough life too. But he started writing books at 21 and he used to write about the East and the West and the difference between that kind of, you know, logical science and and Western mysticism, Eastern mysticism and Western mysticism. And that's what he used to call it. I loved it. Flatland, the West, all span, no depth, (laughs) right? Like a world of surfaces, like which, which when I look at scientists and where they show you what scientists look like, that's what they look like. Yeah. You know, all white and shimmying and no, everything's cold and flat. Yep. You know, everything digital is cold and flat. That's how they show you the future like this, you know. And that's, to me, that's like a it's manifestation of that of that flatland, that flatland thinking, you know. Yeah, man, your, man, at- your man Brian Cox on the BBC is a classic example of that, the scientist guy. He talks about life like it isn't worth living. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and the big smile is like, you're fucking smile is like, yeah, look, he, he looks like he's always taking a shit. You're like, ah, oh, you're, you don't exist, you're dead, you know, you're, you're, you're a fucking robot, you know, and it's like, who it's so that? funny you bring him up. I was talking to a Canadian buddy of mine the other day, and I just went, oh, yeah, that Brian Cox guy, I guess, fucking hate that guy. And I went, yeah, that's true. I, you know what he was? He was the, he was the, I'm going to roll in this, this, oh, I have a few scones with me, funny English haircut, and we're going to roll him in with his constant grin, and we're going to make you re-believe in this bullshit about how he came from a neighbor. Have you ever heard the band that he was in, d or whatever they're called? He was actually in a band, and they're fucking awful. They were like... Uh, they, 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 they sound like a kind of a band a politician's son would, 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 would be in. You know, like it's like totally superficial and cold, you know, it's like things will only get better. You know, it's like <laughs> awful, you know, and then this, this, I mean, this guy obviously has no, you see, it's like when he talks about the concept of what it is, to, and this is a good one. When he talks about the concept of what it means to be alive, I look at him and go, that's not how I fucking experience life. What do you want about? <laughs> <laughs> and yet these, this guy sells out stadium tours. You go, could you imagine oh. like being in that audience? Yeah, you, you just, I mean, it's like you just you just want to slash your wrists. Like the, oh, it, mate, it, mate. How could it exist it's in like, that world? It's like you can always tell the ones that start getting around. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's another one they've wheeled out. You know, and then he can start rabbiting on about, even though I used to love listening to Christopher Hitchens, who was a vehement fucking atheist. But yeah, I used yeah. to love to but, but I love to listen to him just simply because he had such a linguistic fucking command and, 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 and a brutal fucking uncompromising position. So. And outside his atheistic view, he was absolutely brilliant. I mean, oh, he was yeah, yeah, gonna, brilliant. Uh, about Mother Teresa for what she was at a time where, you know, if you just say anything bad about Mother Teresa, you would have been like lynched. And he, he had no of no. it. And he had no no problem pointing out, you know, I often think that, like, again, um, we, we always have this discussion on this show. You have people who fall out of mainstream religion. That's totally understandable. I totally get that. 
But then they fall into the world of like atheism and it's materialistic science. And they forget there's an other, a whole other way of expressing those feelings outside either two of those options. And I find that a terrible tragedy. I really do. Like, I really do. Well, I sometimes wonder whether there's simply souls on karmic journeys and some have been here longer. That old cliche, which you can hear in any new age kind of spiritual world. And, but sometimes I look around and I think, oh, maybe it's fucking true. Because for some reason, as a very young guy, I just knew. Right? I wasn't a fucking racist. I was in 70s Australia. There was fucking plenty of racists. So I didn't become one, right? So, so, and I just knew oh, we have fucking abos and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what's, what's fucking wrong with you? What are you talking about? Oh, and then, 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 then they, they get into, oh, you know, they, what are these savages up to? And I go, well, they're up to something that you don't know. Right? Yeah. They're not, they're not yeah. stomping on the earth and shaking rattles for fuck because they're idiots. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. They're doing stuff. And I was always drawn to those people more. I'd, I'd rather meet Africans than that fucking people that go, because I know that they're fucking doing stuff. Right? They're talking in a language beyond human because the earth doesn't speak human, you know? And so they're, they're, they're doing something. <laughs> And I always found that easy. I don't know. Maybe my old soul is in here going, yeah, we've already got out of that hump. But <laughs> and my experience is I grew up in Ireland when it was very Catholic and I would be one of those types to be take, you know, like really laying into the Catholic church and everything as, as a teenager. And you'd get that certain look of people saying, like, how fucking dare you? How fucking, you know, the, the, the wide-eyed thing, right? Well, now I do the same with the atheists, right? And it's the same <laughs> look. The same fucking reaction, the head twitching, the eyes, like, like the fucking gerbil in their arse found them on the tablet. Like, the same fucking, the same fucking look. Yeah. Mate, they're, they're, talking to a lot of people today, it's like, it's just watching a programmable organism that when certain stimuli hits the nervous system, it just, it just, it just goes like this, right? The religious fanatic and the, the extreme atheist are the same archetype. They're yeah, just exactly expressed, the same they're just expressed through a different software or different over, overshadow. Yeah. Completely, completely. I used to say they're like they're like the person who hates their looks or is ugly and hates that, the person who loves their looks, they're exact same archetype. They just sit yeah. there constantly obsessed with themselves. <laughs> right? Just in different levels. One's having more sex and going to better parties, and the other one's fucking, you know. I would imagine as a, as a stand-up comic and playing all over the world, you'd be very aware of the archetypes, regard of the na- regardless of the nation or the, the culture. I'd say by the response to a certain joke, you can tell. It's almost like you as, as standing on that stage, oh, I've tapped into a specific archetypal core. Did you find that a lot? Like the same person, the same kind of people and audiences all over the world? I didn't... Uh... I didn't think about it in the in archetypical sense, back, archetypal sense back then. I wasn't thinking that deeply, but I did. But I've done enough gigs, and I tell an audience now, I've done enough gigs in my life where the old saying, you know, oh, you know, you can't blame your audience. You know, if you have a bad night, you can't blame your audience. Well, I've done about 20,000 shows. You fucking can, right? Yeah. You, you can, right? Because, because, because an audience makes is the other fucking half of this experience, right? And, and I've done this for 25 years. I've done this to African guys under a tin shed and it worked. How come it's not working here tonight? It's not yeah. me. It's you. <laughs> right. I, I remember you. One, one thing you said, it was very difficult to make the Dutch laugh. Oh, well, it was when I first went there. Jesus yeah. Christ. I can do it now, but still, I, I haven't done it for a few years, so I still have to get, be, 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 uh, get match fit again. Yeah, because those fuckers, at least it's the Irish or the English or the Scots, someone's, if you die and you might, someone go, well, it's fucking not going too well, is it, mate? Right? Yeah, at least yeah. you can have a bit of banter then, right? Yeah. They just don't say fucking anything. The cultural right? thing, just, yeah. That, the, it was the, yeah, that they, was can, they terrifying. can. That must have been quite terrifying until you got that first laugh. Mate, it was, mate, when I first did Amsterdam, like, I didn't, I was there for three nights. I died so bad on the first two nights, every fucking night, right? Because but I was, it was the first gig I'd done outside of a British-speaking country. I just, I've only been doing comedy four years or something, five years. I don't know their kind of 
cultured and educated in Amsterdam. They've got an open mind and a conservative mindset, but they're not talking. And I'm like, I've, I've, I've never done the Dutch. I don't know. I don't know where to go. I don't know yeah. what the fuck. Because I, I can't just go, well, this is going a bit shit. And have one of them go, yeah, it is, mate. Because I just all sit there just thinking, yes, and it's your fault. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a fucking walk through the fire. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting that one, and I think it's like when you when you go to like an uh, like you know England, Ireland, Scotland, parts of America, and they do challenge the comedian. I think that's really important. Uh, I think that's it's almost that's an almost a shamanic thing in itself. It's almost like yeah, I worked out. Go I on. worked out early on trying to do doing local gigs in Australia on a pallet in the corner of a pub where people still aren't even facing the the fucking stage. I used to watch guys try and go, come on, everybody, let's get into it, and watch and try and get their attention. And I started to realise this doesn't work, right, because the enemy, the, the audience is like a beast, right, and it's like, and, and it doesn't want to be told what to do, but it wants to be led, right? So I started going up on stage and, and just standing there right, and just saying nothing. And so if they didn't shut up, I just stood there. And so the people who were waiting got nothing because I started to realise that what they're actually scared of, the position I'm in is where they're most scared to stand in front of other people and speak. Right? None of them in the crowd wants to do this. Though maybe some of them want to, but they're fucking petrified. They're petrified of this fucking standing here. Right? So when you don't do anything, they consciously and unconsciously start to realise, fuck, he's not scared. He must be good. Yeah. Right. And, and and so then they shut up. Right. Yeah. So then they'll start to shut up because also they know that because also they want to be led. But if I, but if the performer is weak, they're like a, a lion, they'll fucking kill it. Right? They want to kill it, but they don't, right? So it's, it's this double-edged thing with the audience. They they they'd like to kill anything that's weak, but they actually want to be led. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just worked it. Yeah, just shut your mouth, <laughs> right? And let and let the silence do all the fucking talking for you, right? Tell me, tell me, and tell the world the migration between metal and comedy. How did that come about? Were you telling jokes with the band, or or people said you should do that on a stage or anything like that? Was it? How did it happen? Well, I was I was in bands from like sixteen until so sixteen. And I just did nothing but bands, bands. I lived in band world. I, you know, I was, I had big dreams. I made a death metal band in 1983 in, in the Blue Mountains, 100 kilometres outside of Australia. Yeah. With no money on the dole. Is this going to, is this, is this a good plan for success? No. Are you going to do it? Of course. Yeah. Right, right. 150 fucking percent. Right. Because. <laughs> It obsessed me for some reason, right? I was obsessed. Once I got into music, I was obsessed. So for the next 15 years, all I did was bands and bands and bands and bands. Made fucking... But I was always funny. Not on stage. I took music very fucking seriously. Right? right? I'm one of those musos. I'm, I'm, and and I'm, not, I'm not a backseat drummer. I'm a what's the album cover look like? What's the mix of the album like? What's the fucking guitar sound like? Right? I have fucking input into this. Yeah. And so, but when you're in a band like I was, one of them, the third band I was in, that worked for five years and did fucking hundreds of shows and made two albums and then gets on the road and then the singer goes, oh, I actually don't want to do this. This is Slaughter Lord. And no, this was Slaughter Lord was the first real underground uh, thrash metal band. Then I was in a band called Mortal Sin, which was a, the oh, second yeah. of the other thrash metal band in Australia, but I toured overseas with that band with Faith No More, Testament, and all that kind of stuff. Never made records, just did a big tour, so that was great. Got out of the country. Then I made a band in the mid '90s and the early '90s. It wasn't metal; it started as a hybrid because we suddenly, I suddenly start, started uh, around '87 when thrash metal became big. I started listening to Kate Bush, and Peter Gabriel, and Simple Minds, and Super Tramp, and U2 again, and and just I wanted I wanted to know how to, how did Sting write a song with one riff in it. Yeah, and it wasn't boring. You didn't notice. Right? We're from heavy metal world. We got fifty riffs in the fucking song, right? And, you know, and I, I got really interested in and in wanting to know how to 
play drums besides hard. You know, I got obsessed with like Sting and Manu Kashe drumming and guys and Stuart, all that hi hat work. And yeah. got guys that could hold beats like like just. And, and repetition. How is repetition not boring? I need to know all this. Right? Yeah. And so the, oh, here's, the, here's, I got, here's how I got into comedy. Here's how I got into comedy because I made I made this band for five years to two albums, and then I suddenly realised I'm at the mercy of other people. Suddenly, the bass player becomes a fucking drug addict. Suddenly, the singer realises he doesn't want to do this. He wants to get married to Rachel and have two kids. He doesn't want to sit in a van with fucking guys. Because that's what that's what happens when you're in bands, and especially if you get a bit of success, you might have to with young people. You might have to deal with what's going to come up in them. You know, they, they'll self sabotage. I've self sabotaged, wrecked things, and so forth. You know, and that's why some guy suddenly becomes a drug addict. We just made our second album, and you're going to get into heroin now. Why? Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, and so I realised, you know. I'm, and I was always funny, but not on stage. Yeah. But funny with me mates, being an idiot, fucker. I could, I could just make people laugh. I could just, people laughed. I went to parties. I made people laugh. And, we and you were, uh, you weren't, you weren't depending on anybody else. So you were, you're your own. Yeah, nothing yeah. Else. Only you could go wrong. Yeah. And so yeah. then I, then I, and we also, if I'm, uh, if I'm honest, though, I was always watching like Billy Connolly, and then even in the early '80s, we used to listen to. Uh, yeah. Cosby, uh, Bill Cosby records. We listened to Slayer and Bill Cosby records, you know. And then, then <laughs> the late eighties, we watched Richard Pryor and Steve Martin and Eddie Murphy all the time. Fabulous, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. And I was, I saw stand-up com- comedy through Billy Connolly, and that throughout my life, I saw it. Oh, look, funny guys that make people laugh. It's cool, you know. But it wasn't until the sort of nineties I thought, you know, what, maybe I could fucking do it. Yeah. So I did a short drama course, an improvisational course, which is how I ended up going out with the drama teacher, actually, and she introduced me to tons of books that were fucking brilliant, you know, shamanism and all that. That's when my brain went into that world as well. And then uh, then I was in a black metal band to the end of the 90s, which is just a recording band, and we made a, did a couple of live shows. And I had an Irish buddy I was living with in Australia, and he, uh, I'm still friends with today. And then uh, I just met him there. He was on holidays, just being a young metalhead and getting drunk and carrying on. Then his visa got revoked, uh, finished, and he had to go back to Ireland. And I had a British passport, and he just went, you should come. And I went, fuck yeah, I should come. (laughs) So I just got an English passport. Then I just went, right. But I started comedy in Australia for about three years, but I just realised I can't rely on people in bands anymore. They're too much fucking hard work. I've always been full on. Like, I'm, I'm in. I'm in, guys. I'm fucking in. Like, I'll draw the fucking album cover with a pen if I have to. I'm in. And to get blokes that would, you know, I used to dream, why can't I live in a house with the whole band? We rehearse every day for 10 hours a day. You know, I want to be, you know, I, you always had to deal with, oh, I don't want to come or I don't want to do this. But people that just wouldn't fucking keep up. So I suddenly thought, if I become a comedian, then there's no fucking one to keep up. <laughs> I've, always, I've always often been amazed it truly been amazed and like have I've been in that position myself as you yourself. Bands like U2 and The Who, how they could stay together, work together and be friends for decades. It's almost like a, a, a supernatural gift in itself. They're the bands with like Rush. Yeah. Like Rush, you can't, you, they're the bands where you can't replace anyone anymore. You can't. Imagine trying to go, oh, we've got a new guy on drums in U2. This is Colin Henderson. <laughs> No, nah, no, nah. they're amazing, those bands. I know because I've had a band that had, whether it would have stayed together, I don't think, but it it, it had, was it the right time? It was the first band, Slaughter Lord. It was with when I was too young to understand the magic I had. I had magic with some of these guys, right? right? It wasn't until I, that broke, broke up and I thought, I'll just get some other guys and realised, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, fuck. What have I done? Yeah. What have I fucking done? Yeah. Oh boy, it's like the 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 girl that you dumped, and a few years later, after being through a few horror stories, you're like, "What the fuck have I done?" Yeah, mate, that's that. That's when I realised this is that special fuck. It's like REM. No, we could never find another drummer. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like it's like when Steve Adler got a drug, became a drug addict in Guns N' Roses, and then had to leave. And they kicked him out because he's a drug addict. I read Slash's book. He goes, "We thought, oh, we can find another drummer. It's just basic rock and roll." And every fucking one we tried out, we went, why doesn't it sound like that guy? 
<laughs> chemistry, chemistry. You know, that's interesting what you were saying that like when trash was getting really big and you were at the like in the, in deep in it, you got into like Kate Bush and stuff like that. Uh, you, if you listen to like Burtsum, Varg, and you, you think like that, you listen to that music, death metal, right? And all his favorite bands are like The Cure and The Dead Can Dance, the complete opposite. I think that that juxtaposition is extremely important. I always used to say every to myself, aspect of life. I always used to say to myself, when people go, you like this type of music, all this music, you like Enya and that. I go, mate, to me, Slayer and Kate Bush are the same thing. Why? Well, they're doing what they want. You can feel the spirit. Like the first Bortsum album, and you, people are like, I played that for people, and all they're hearing is screaming. And I says, you can't feel the kind of majestic spiritual energy in that. Mate, those riffs, that the riffs that fucking guy writes. Yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. On the way, on the way he used space in the, in, in the, in the, you know, it, it, in like Dunkeitel, that 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 it's the simple yeah. synthesizer playing two notes. Fucking yeah. hell! You know, it's because he listened to music that wasn't metal that that came. Of course, in. yeah. As I always say to the guys who, who, who you know, I know when you're a young metalhead, you're a young metalhead. For five years, I was a fucking metalhead, mate. Nothing else. Right, even when thrash came, it wasn't all old metal went for me. It was just thrash and 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 you know some extreme punk and stuff. It all went. I mean, Henry Rollins once said he was into Led Zeppelin and Journey and, and whatever. And then once he heard the Ramones and the Sex Pistols, and went, <laughs> yeah, you know that that's gone. You know, and that's what happened to me in, in 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 heavy metal and stuff. And so, but I always, but I you know. You, there's music that came before heavy metal even. So I was already listening to, when I was young, you know, Meatloaf and ABBA. And, and I'd, I'd hear Kate Bush. Because he was Australian in the 70s, 80s. Kate Bush comes on the telly. You know, we, we used to watch Doctor Who and then they put the goodies in Doctor Who. But in yeah. between, they'd always play a, a film clip. And I saw Kate Bush all the time. Just singing and dancing around. And then I used to go, I used to like it. I used to like the songs. And this guy said, I knew this English bloke who was into Kate Bush. So... Because we were lucky to grow up in the radio. Our radio had killer fucking musicians and bands on it, you know, Queen yeah. and Super Tramp and Pink Floyd. And, and, and you, know, you just listen to it on the radio, yeah. you know. I mean, Kate Bush was a remarkable experience when you were like 14 watching that. You not only were being jump started into puberty, but you were also being uh, spellbound by like, what the fuck is this music, you know? Oh. She was. She was like a, something that arrived on a spaceship from another planet and is oh. still here for a while and then will go back off, you know? And what's, what I've noticed about myself too over the years is that when some people hear something like that, they go, what is this? I never really had that. I never thought anything was too weird. But right, right, just sort of if I like it, I don't fucking like it. I don't like it. It doesn't, it's like when sometimes people go, you know, when people like you see a couple in a comedy audience and the guy's looking at his wife to see if he can laugh or there's oh, people that yeah, work yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I sit there and I think I, th I sit there and I think to myself how can you ever hold back laughter it's, I've never thought to think I just laugh yeah don't you, don't, don't you just laugh don't you just hey it's fucking funny right yeah <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> along with yourself my other favorite comic comedian is Reginald Hunter. And I've oh, I, I toured with Reg a lot. I was at Reg's house two days ago. Oh, I, oh, I'd love to get him on the show. She put in a word for me. But uh, right. I, I, he's, you know, I've seen gigs that he's played smaller places like yourself. And he would, you know, like yourself, he does go over the outside the pale now and again in a very kind of subtle way. And you can see people in the audience like looking in both cases, looking Am I supposed to laugh at this? Will I be considered racist or sexist? Yeah. <laughs> and you can see, like yourself and him, are obviously having fun doing that. Oh, mate. Well, because because here's one of the greatest problems about political correctness is people go, well, these people get offended. Now, here's the fucking bit that pisses me off. I don't actually believe they are actually offended. No, they're not. They're, they're just not. programmed. They're lying. They're, they're lying. <laughs> they're, they're, ha they're laughing. You know yourself. We all, even to this day, you will hear a, an extremely unpolitically correct joke. 
And you, 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 you'll say, oh, you, the way you're, I, I react to it is like, oh, for fuck's sake. But what, what, what's really, I'm doing, I'm, I'm laughing inside, you know? I'm laughing inside. Well, one, I know it's propaganda, right? Right, right. I learned a lot about fucking, about being a human through doing comedy. Well, I don't know it's propaganda. You get people like Kate Smith like, going on about going, well, why should these comedians be allowed to go on there and do these filthy, racist, sexist, homophobic jokes about... Well, I've done comedy for 25 years, Kate. I've seen thousands of shows. Thousands of shows across England, Europe, right? Where are these comedians you're talking about? Yep. <laughs> right? Right, I'm sure a few comics are, are, are nutty. You've got too pissed and fucking tried to crack onto a bird somewhere in a dressing room, or been a bit fucking rude, or had a spaz out like all human beings do something. But where's this? I've never met the racist comedians. Where are they? And I Where would the go, fuck are they? Right? I would where's go this? one step further. Do you remember Bernard Manning? Oh, you Bernard course. Manning used to tell the greatest one-liner in a comic in history. He used to tell constant anti-Irish jokes. And every totally. Irish person that watched him would be pissing themselves laughing. Because I'll tell you why. I, I, I even went to see him live. There was no malice in it. Exactly. it was, there was no malice. He did not hate Irish people. He, he did not hate black people. He did not hate Pakistani people. There no. was no malice. Exactly, Where the, man. the real malice is on the other side who pretend that they, they care about minorities. That's yeah. where the real malice is. I mean, even it's Reggie... Completely. Reddy Hunter even tells a joke about where he's over white people are always apologizing to him. And that, that joke he tells where the, the black guy bumped into him, a white guy bumped into a movie in a movie theater and says, sorry, I didn't see it. And then he was like really worried, like, oh, did I say something really offensive? And he says something like, was that fucking hatred in your heart when you said it? No, you did nothing wrong, you know? <laughs> Completely. They're completely, even, you know, it's like the way the word hate. It's, it's, to me, I, I can even look at it like this. Yeah. I've never trusted the, the, the mainstream crowd. Right, right, right. Mainstream. I've never been in the mainstream. Even anything, getting married. You know, if I got married, which I wouldn't, but I'd do it in the woods with some fucking guy and fucking join hands with my bride and blood or something, right? I'm, I'm like that. So, so the, the mainstream, I've got guys, I know guys here in England who are super famous comedy. So, so one of them said to me once when he got big, big, he goes, the gigs are getting worse. I said, of course they are, because you're getting the mainstream, mainstream now. These people don't go anywhere. They're not told. They don't investigate things. Their life are not their lives are imbibed in thinking about art. My, my, my whole existence is imbibed in art and yeah. music and the right, 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 and the poetry and, and, and movies and wanting to look at interesting people and they're not. Right? Yeah, so, so to yeah. make them laugh is very fucking hard. Yeah. Because they don't have any imagination. They don't, they don't. It's like when people mock Michael McIntyre. I go, mate, I love Michael McIntyre. They're like, why? I go, because he's making the fucking dullest people laugh. <laughs> no, speaking of Michael McIntyre, speaking of Michael McIntyre, I was amazed when you and Reginald Hunter got onto the on the Apollo show on the BBC. Did so someone did, did, uh, that was I was like I couldn't believe it uh, that they let they, they let they let either one of you near the, the BBC. But <laughs> at time, was there someone like Michael McIntyre got you in there, pulled strip, like helped you out? Well, well, basically, I don't think it was as savage as it is now. And they were, they took a risk. My agents got me into that Apollo one, but right. Michael McIntyre, I may have. Who knows how I got into Michael's? Could have been my agents. I'm sure they played a part in it. But also, see, here's the thing: I was around when Michael McIntyre was just starting. And he was in the clubs, right? And comics would get the shits, right? Now, he's a bit of a pompous fucking guy, right? right? But we're in the world of entertainment. Are you, are you surprised that there's mutants in here who are egotistical or on drugs or neurotic? Or like, like you're, in, you're in entertainment. You're in comedy, right? So he's a bit of a pompous twat. Who gives a fuck, right? And so, but they were, I knew what they were really upset about because he was killing. <laughs> right he was he was fucking wiping the floor with every fucking gig he did right and i was there standing there laughing right yeah. but see the good thing about me is I'm, I'm i'm not in that competitive spirit with the wife because i know what i do 
right? And where Mike can yeah. go, I know he can he can go to that zone, right? I'm not going to go to that zone. Why? Because I'm I'm like Slayer. They don't they don't think how come we haven't sold as many records as Fleetwood Mac? We know why we haven't sold as many fucking records as Fleetwood yeah. Mac, right? We sing about Satan and death and politics and fucking chaos and dressed in spikes and play ugly music, right? So I'm like that, you know, they're like, oh, Steve, why don't you want to get on the TV? Because I don't want to go into that world. Yeah. Because I can't function in that world. And they don't want me in that world. Well, well Michael, so, McIntyre, so, Michael McIntyre is very original. I, as, as mainstream as he is, I can't think of another comedian that came that had that act before him. You know, the, he's the kind of public schoolboy, Middle England thing going on. But he's... He was original. No one had that before him. And I think... No one had that. No originality, one had that. originality is so important in all this stuff. And he had, he had, you know, so it's just observational comedy. Yeah, but it's done with a minute fucking detail and skill, comedy skill. Let's not forget that. This guy's got comedy skill, mate. I've, I've done enough gigs. I've watched his material. He's got callbacks. He's got rounds. He fucking knows what he's doing. <laughs> and he gets 20 minutes out of the drawer next to the seat with the fucking sticky tape in. Right. So as much as you go, oh, it's just about the drawer next to the sink. Yeah, he wrote 20 minutes about a fucking drawer with sticky tape and fucking sandwich bags in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, we're, wrap, we're wrapping up now. I'm sorry, like, what's happened here is that you and I, this Irish fella and Australia fella, we've created this alternative reality. Don't feel outside of Jason or anything like that. This is how the fuck we are. We're just, this is, we would just, well, this, y'all have already this, answered all the questions. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's, it's like the Irish, Irish Australian version of Ebonics, but that, it, that's what it is in a way. But, but, uh, it, 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 it's been fantastic, Steve. Uh, this is, just, you've been brilliant. And, uh, the, look, None of us are going anywhere right now. Well, they're, they're, <laughs> he went to fucking LA. But uh, what are you? What are you? Have you got any plans for the future? Like, do you have a film or anything? Are you, are well, you, I suppose, well, I'm doing the tour is booked here for the UK, which I came over, you know, a year and a half ago to do. And then, uh, so it's supposed to be starting September 22nd in Cardiff, I think, going for about 25, 30 get dates up into November. So I've got to start doing previews for that this week. So I've been doing clubs in the past few weeks. Smashing it! I've, I, I, I'll, I decided to. When you're back in, when are you back in Ireland? I don't know when I can get over there without having things stuck up your nose or carrying yeah. on with all this fucking quarantine. I'm not letting any fucking one quarantine me like a fucking hell. <laughs> well, if, well if, you, if you get to somewhere like Belfast, I'll come and see you or something like that. So that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what's the tour going to be like? Is it going to be? Which, are you going right. to be in a whole new show? Well, it will be. I know. Well, well I've got to. Uh, I've got. To, I've got two shows because I, I. I went back to Australia in 2014 to go through a dark night at the Soul for about seven fucking years. So that was an interesting time, you know, taking me into the world of psych meds and suicidal depression and how to get out of psych meds and fucking, you know, how I ended up in that fucking world. Well, you know. Oh, probably because I didn't oh, listen to the fucking universe tapping me on the shoulder for fucking decade. Go, you got the knowledge, dickhead. Wake up. <laughs> Oh, that did actually that would be very appropriate in this 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 fucking lockdown time. I think that's probably going wow. to help a lot of people. Uh, and because I did, I did. My yeah. last show is is highly is 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 totally sort of piece, you know, pointing out feminism and, and and transgenderism. And I've so I'm gonna I'm gonna not cut that out. But I'm gonna hone it down because I only got to do it in Australia like seven times. That's a tour in Australia. The show's never finished in seven fucking shows. You know, it starts to get good after about twenty shows. So. So I'm going to mix these two shows together. And plus, I'm thinking of stuff that uh, is, has been happening, of course, in the past year. And I've got tons of material. The only other thing it is is getting that base solid show embedded in your fucking memory. You know, because you, I need it. I need. That's why I got to do. Once I've got a show embedded in my memory, so then I can perform. You know, because I don't have. To, there's nothing worse than standing on stage going, "What the fuck is the next bit?" What's, oh fuck! That's right. Or you come off going, oh fuck! How did I forget that bit? Right? I just need it. I just need it in me, and then just right. Now I can walk around with it in me, and now I can just fucking. Perform. Then you can riff and make shit up as you go. Though. So I'm looking forward to getting on the road for that because that's always a, beautiful. It's like it's like Omar Hakim, the guy who drummed for Sting and stuff on the first solo Sting solo album and stuff. He goes, 
It's a great way to describe drumming. He goes, well, learn all the rudiments, learn all the stuff, learn all this technique and get all that there. He goes, and then once you've got the body work and it's all like this, he goes, then all that stuff you learn, throw it in the bin. Yeah. Now you can dance. <laughs> yeah. Jason, <laughs> Jason, do you want to say anything to Steve before he goes? Oh, man, this was great. Uh, I had questions for you, and you psychically picked up on all of them. I was going to ask you about, you know, what advice would you give, you know, to someone who's an underground composer, an underground musician, and he just started talking about it. So I just needed to sit and listen. It's been beautiful. Glad glad I could hear you guys talk for a while. Oh, man, it's been great. Yeah, I'd love to come on again with the talk. Yeah, we will. Now that we've broken the ice, we'll do a, a one more on the kind of like the spe- we understand each other in terms of music because we're, we're all in, involved in one way. Either. I'd love to do that if you want to come on. And uh, again, well, you know, music music was another great way for me to understanding that. Yeah, I was, shit, I was shitting bricks before you came on uh, meeting you, but I'm um, like I'm relaxed now, so we can talk about. Yeah, we'll do we'll do a we'll do a a more comprehensive show. I would love that if you would come back. I'm sure. I'm sure the listeners would too. Oh, we could have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. I, it's, it's nothing I like better than being able to talk to people on a level and not have to fucking explain really? everything. <laughs> no, no, you know what's no, so funny? It's funny well, people saying like, like you know, the amount of conspiracy or stuff, whatever you want to say, I've read over twenty five fucking years and, and listened to, and, and which is a mixture of everything from alternative history to fucking shamanism to fucking my own experiences, right? And then you get someone who's never done anything, and they go, "Okay, Steve, well, t- tell me what you believe." I go, "Well, one, it's not belief. Secondly, it's taken twenty five fucking years of processing and my own this, so yeah." So, 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 with these people who've done nothing, and then go, "Well, tell me," I'm thinking, "Man, you've got a long." Yeah. It's not much. It's not just about me telling you stuff and then you believe it. You've got to. You've got to internally change. Bro. Yeah, that's why. Right. <laughs> and that, that's, and that, and that's, and that's a spiritual process in itself. Yeah, it's big fucking time. So thanks again, Steve. Thanks, Jason, for hosting the show over there in LA. And thanks everybody for watching the symposium again. And uh, look, Steve, stay safe uh, and look after yourself in this fucking mad world we live in at the moment and we'll see you on again here soon on the Beyond no, no symposium it's been a pleasure. God, bless. God bless thank you